From the previous section, we've learned that heat transfer modes include conduction, convection, and radiation. In this section, we'll focus on conduction, Fourier's law, and steady-state heat transfer problem. Conduction transfers heat energy by molecules colliding with each other. Macroscopically, we use Fourier's law to describe conduction behavior. Consider an electric heater. Heat energy is provided by electricity. The amount of heat transferred into the heating coil per unit time is called the heat flow rate, and the capital letter Q is used in this course. If we divide Q by the cross-section of the coil, we get the heat flow rate per unit area, and we call this term heat flux, and use the lowercase q to denote it. Another important term we want to introduce is the thermal conductivity K. It's a material parameter that describes a material's capability of transferring heat. The larger K is, the faster a material transfers heat through conduction. Fourier's law describes the relationship between heat flux Q and the temperature gradient, which can be understood as the temperature change in spatial coordinate. It states that heat flux equals to thermal conductivity multiplied by the negative of the temperature gradient. As we mentioned before, thermal conductivity represents the material's ability to transfer heat. According to Fourier's law, for a given amount of heat flux, the larger the thermal conductivity is, the smaller the temperature gradient is. Let's explain this by an example of a composite window. And this window is made of two layers of glasses with air in between. How does such a composite window get good insulation results? In fact, the thermal conductivity of air is much less than glass. Thus, for the same amount of heat flux, the temperature gradient in the glass is much smaller than that in air. If we plot the temperature distribution across the window thickness, we can see that the largest temperature drop occurs in the air layer. In other words, it's the air layer that provides most of the insulation result. Now let's simplify the problem and look at this one layer glass window to understand why there's a negative sign in Fourier's law. Assuming it's a cold winter day and the temperature inside is higher than outside, the heat always flows to the lower temperature side according to the second law of thermodynamics. Then the temperature gradient in the heat flux direction is minus delta T divided by window's thickness delta X. However, the thermal conductivity of a material is always a positive value. Thus, we need to put a negative sign into the Fourier's law to balance the two sides of the equation. Since the current Fourier's law is expressed as a function of heat flux, how does it relate to heat flow rate? Take this bar for example. The left side has a higher temperature T1, and the right side has a lower temperature T2. The cross-section A is uniform along the length L. Assuming the temperature changes linearly along the bar, then the temperature gradient can be replaced by T2 minus T1 divided by L. Recall that heat flow equals heat flux multiplied by the cross-section area. So we can express the Fourier's law with respect to heat flow rate. With some rearrangement, we can encapsulate the length, cross-section area, and the conductivity into one term, and we call it thermal resistance. Note that thermal resistance is inversely proportional to conductivity. It's not of a completely different material property. You may find the thermal resistance very familiar. In fact, in electric flow, we have a term electric resistance to quantify a material's ability to conduct electricity. The Fourier's law shares the same form as Ohm's law for electric flow in a circuit. In this simple case, the temperature at two ends of the bar is analogous to the voltage potential at two ends of the circuit, and the heat flow can be compared to the electric current, and the thermal resistance is similar to the electric resistance. It turns out that, for some simplified problems, we can solve a heat transfer problem in a similar way as solving a circuit problem. For example, putting thermal resistance in parallel or in series. But that topic is out of the scope of this course. Like Ohm's law, Fourier's law doesn't involve time and only describes the steady state of a conduction problem. To better illustrate the idea of steady state, let's take a look at this boiling pot on the stove. The pot is made of stainless steel in both the body and the handle. When the pot is on the stove for just 10 seconds, we know it's okay to touch the handle because heat hasn't been transferred to the handle yet. 
Now imagine someone forgot to turn off the stove and keep it on for an hour. When you notice it, will you move the pot without an oven glove? You probably won't, since after such a long time, the handle is nearly as hot as the body itself. And in this case, we say the pot has reached a steady state condition, since temperature is stable and no longer changing. The aim of performing steady state thermal analysis is to find the temperature distribution of a system when heat transfer has reached a steady state. Let's use a simulation to further illustrate the application and purpose of steady state thermal analysis. Here, we are looking at a simple solenoid system with a metal core generating heat, a layer of insulator, and a coil layer. There is a constant heat loss at the free surfaces and a constant temperature boundary condition on the one side of the bracket. First, we solve the problem as a steady state thermal analysis to obtain the temperature distribution over the coil part. Next, we include the time effect into the simulation, and we call this analysis transient thermal analysis, which we'll cover in more detail in a later section. The objective is to find the temperature distribution when heating the coil for different time durations. Of course, solving the system with different duration, say 10 seconds, 60 seconds, or 200 seconds, the temperature distribution will be different. However, if we solve the system with an extremely long time, say 800 seconds for this case, we'll see the result will become stable and reach a steady state that is very close to our steady state analysis. This proves that steady state thermal analysis simply looks for the final state of the heat transfer problem. We cannot find intermediate thermal results at a certain time by steady state analysis, as time is not involved in such analysis. In fact, this is also the advantage of steady state analysis, as we simplify the system by removing the effect of time and avoid needing to solve the system for a very long duration to get stable results. The simulation we just showed is a 3D problem with different type of materials. In most engineering problems, solving the equation of Fourier's law directly to find an analytical solution is impossible. The alternative way here is to solve the Fourier's law numerically by discretizing the domain. Through such methods, the differential equation can be transformed to a matrix equation. Here, we use finite element method to such discretization. Here is the governing equation in the finite element form for a steady state heat transfer problem. And in this equation, the temperature is our unknowns in the vector. K is the conductivity stiffness as a matrix, and Q is the heat load given to the system. This format of equation may remind you the governing equation in static structural analysis, where we have displacement as unknowns, structural stiffness matrix, and external load vector. The analogy between the two fields is clear through such a comparison. In static structural analysis, it's known that we need enough boundary condition to prevent rigid body motion. And the same is true in steady state heat transfer problems, as we need sufficient thermal boundary conditions. Otherwise, the problems are not solvable. For example, in this analysis of a boiling pot, if we provide a heat source without a boundary condition, the resulting temperature will go infinitely high, what we may refer to as thermal runaway, similar to rigid body motion in structural analysis. Now, a little bit more discussion of the heat flux and the heat flow term in Fourier's law. You might recall that both heat flux and heat flow rate are defined as per unit time. However, this doesn't mean time effects is considered in Fourier's law. In steady state analysis, heat flux or heat flow is continuous and constant without changing in time. In other words, a steady state doesn't necessarily mean no heat flow or no temperature gradient. Take this window as an example again. There's a heater indoor to keep the room at a constant temperature, and outside is cold in a snowy day. There's a continuous heat flow from indoor to outdoor through the window, yet the problem is still steady state because the temperature in the system doesn't change with time.